Howdy, howdy, all. Welcome on into Goose Talks Film for a vermin infested episode of Goose Talks Film. I'm your host, Goose, and we are tackling the new release horror movie Infested, also known in France as Vermin or Vermin. Uh, yeah, so this is maybe about spiders. If you're a severe arachnophobe uh, or spiders for whatever reason trigger you and you can't handle it, then this isn't the movie or episode for you. <laughs> but uh, if this movie is for you or was for you, uh, then this podcast will be for you. So uh, Infested is a 2023 slash 2024 uh, horror movie. It is a French horror movie. Uh, so, well, before my research for this episode, uh, just before I started watching this last night, actually, I thought this was, this was a Shutter uh, original. So the confusing part is, uh, I think within France, I don't think it's in Europe, just in France itself, where the movie was made and produced. Um, that this was actually a production of Netflix, and it was actually released uh, at the movie's limited release. Now I'm not sure uh, in terms of if it was just released in France or in Europe. I know for sure that we didn't get it in Australia at the movies, and I don't think North America and uh, other places got it either. I'm not cool. Yeah, it's hard to get fine information because there is no Wikipedia page for this movie. It's just IMDb and uh, other websites that I use for researching. So yeah. Anyway, so this is a technically a Shutter original outside of France because they have the distributing rights. Um, certainly in America, anyway, they have the distributing rights on their streaming platform. But within France, it was released to the movies, well, to the theaters by Netflix and is releasing uh, on their platform in France. But yeah, it's a bit cloudy with the information on this. It's hard to get, and it's really confusing with distribution rights, especially that's what happens with these uh, small movies, especially a lot of horror movies, that there's a lot of distribution companies that get the releases in their own countries, slash continent. So it does get a bit confusing. It's not like, you know, your 20th Century Foxes and like your Disney's and stuff where they release it worldwide themselves. They're, yeah, it gets a bit dicey, especially with production companies as well. Like when I reviewed uh, Late Night with the Devil a couple of days ago, that had about six different production companies and it can be the same with distribution companies depending on uh, where it's released. But anyway, so infested uh, residents of a rundown French apartment building battle against an army of deadly, rapidly rapidly reproducing spiders. So as I stated, uh, I am like... I do consider myself an arachnophobe. Like, I do have arachnophobia. I can't handle spiders if there's a huntsman or something. Like, I'm usually the one that's not dealing with it. <laughs> and I do freeze up and have a bit of panic. It's only the big ones, which is quite ironic because here in Australia, you know, when I'm talking big, I'm talking the size of a huntsman. Uh, so, for non Australian listeners, it's uh, probably a bit smaller than a tarantula, it, it, definitely in terms of thickness and uh, the actual size and thickness of its legs and its body and stuff. But a huntsman, like full grown, the really big, big huntsmen are really like the ones you see in movies where they've got a long skinny body and their legs are so fucking long and they're hairy and they're dark. And I'm look- literally looking above me and around my shoulder as I'm talking about them. <laughs> but yeah, I'm. it's funny because I've seen redbacks and, you know, they're the probably the most poisonous spider that I think we get here in my area. I don't think we get uh, funnel webs really anywhere close to here. We do have a lot of poisonous snakes, though. But in terms of spiders, uh, redbacks are probably the worst that we get. Um, and I'm not, it's funny, because I guess because one, they're not quick, and two, they're not very big. They're easy to deal with. But it's funny, because huntsmen's aren't deadly to humans at all. Like, and they're rarely aggressive. They obviously get protective if they they feel threatened like any spider. But um, yeah, so this was a bit of a squirm fest for me. Um, but... I can kind of, it's funny, I can take myself out of, like, arachnophobia are from 1990 with Jeff Daniels. I've watched a million times. I, like, I own it on digital, on Prime. I watch it, you know, once or twice every year. It's one of my Halloween movies I watch. And it does that doesn't bother me. I guess this one maybe made me a bit more squeamish because uh, this one definitely takes itself entirely serious. Like, this isn't like, an arachnophobia is probably, you would say, 65 70% serious and 30% a bit of comedy and a bit of goofballness to it. Whereas, yeah, Infested is 100% tax itself seriously. The um, 
characters are all serious, the setting's serious, the stakes are high. Like this is if if you really want um what the shark genre has gotten in the past, um where you have a good balance of some real silly slapstick stupid movies, some ones in the middle, a bit like arachnophobia, or you have your full serious ones, you know, like with shark movies, it's, you know, your jaws and, um, I can't even think of anyone off the top of my head. Oh, uh, the one with, uh, Blake Lively, the shallows, they take themselves very seriously and they might be unintentionally goofy. Like if they haven't aged well, like parts of jaws, but a movie like the shallows that takes itself very seriously. And it's a very, to a degree, realistic movie, right? Whereas with Spider movies, we never really got that before. It's mainly been arachnophobia, like I said. It that relatively um, leans more into the horror, but there is definitely you know like John Goodman's character is a bit of a comedic relief type character. There's some comedic moments uh, with Jeff Daniels, especially in the wine cellar. You have eight legged freaks, like this, like I said, leans one hundred percent into the comedy with some horror kills and some gore and stuff like that. Whereas, yeah, the spider subgenre has never really got a widespread of that. It's always been those two categories, really. And when there have been the full serious ones that try to take themselves serious, or they haven't had the budget or it's been poorly made and executed, uh, where it's, yeah, the graphics are terrible, the visual effects are uh, terrible and blah, 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 blah. Whereas with Infested, we are fucking treated to a movie that not only takes itself serious, the visual effects are great, the acting's great, the setting's really cool, the subtitles did not bother me at all, but I'm a person that watches a lot of um, Asian cinema and TV, so that's never really bothered me. But I generally was, halfway through this, I forgot I was watching a subtitled movie. It was one of those movies, a bit like Memories of Murder that I've covered on the podcast, that are so good you forget that you're reading subtitles because you're so invested, not infested, invested, <laughs> that you don't realize you're reading these subtitles. You're so just engrossed in what's happening that you forget. And that's the whole of a great movie, not just a foreign language movie, just a great movie. And, you know, we have Sting, a uh, Australian slash American movie coming out uh, next week and the week after, depending on where you live. So that's another... Uh, bigger budget than this for sure. Uh, this I think only had a couple of mil, whereas I think Sting at least would have about 10, 12 mil. So it'd be fun to compare these two and um, just for a fun comparison, uh, hopefully I can see Sting in the next few weeks and I'll, I might do like a once I review both of them individually, I might do a um, comparison video like Infested versus Sting. I think that, that'd just be fun. Um, they're what you consider like um, twin movies or sibling movies where Two movies come out relatively the same time and they focus kind of on the same, um, not say exact same plot, but the same idea. And, you know, these both involve spiders in a horror setting um, and they're not entirely realistic. They lean a bit into the non-realistic side of it. But, yeah, it'd be really fun to compare. I'm really excited to see Sting now. I've seen Infested. Uh, I've got high expectations though. So, hopefully uh, my Aussies can do what the French did with this one. So, um, yeah, I'll stop, uh, I'll stop talking crap, but, uh, as I do here on Goose Talks Film, I always rate a new release movie out of three categories. If I recommend you to go see it or not, which is go see this at movies, wait until streaming or don't bother at all. This one's obviously a tough one because I think it's already done its theatrical release in France and, and or like Europe. I'm not sure. Like I said, it's very clear to get that info at the moment. Um, and obviously, yeah, this is available on Shutter and maybe other streaming, like digital, you might have to rent depending on where you live. But outside of France, most likely you have to watch it on streaming anyway. But this would have been a really good uh, theatrical view- viewing. I'm disappointed I didn't have the opportunity to see this at the movies. I thought um, it would have been a really good movie experience, especially with like, you know, a densely populated cinema would have made this even more fun or maybe watching this with a group of mates would have been really fun. But it didn't ruin my experience at all. I just think those experiences might have been more fun. And that may be what goes in Sting's favor. It is getting a, a worldwide release. So if it's a good movie and it's a good theater experience, 
more people might lean to that. But yeah, I'm, I'm really intrigued to compare those movies once I've seen them in the next couple of weeks, seen them both. Uh, but yeah, look, I would recommend it to go see some movies if you could, but definitely watch this on streaming. If you have the opportunity, if you have a spare hour and 40, 40 minutes, watch this for sure. Uh, like I said, this is on Shutter. This is on Shutter in Australia, uh, and it's in North America and other places as well, like I said. So uh, yeah, if you're not squeamish or you're a little bit squeamish, but that doesn't stop you from watching um, Spider involvement in movies, then I would 100% recommend this. You don't have to be a so much a horror fan to watch this and enjoy this. I think this would be a good watch for people that like movies about you know animals and about maybe like the science of animals and how these things can become hybrids and reproduce and obviously not to the extent in the movie. That's obviously a bit unrealistic. But in terms of that, I think this um, probably a, even more so than Late Night with the Devil, this might have a bit more of a wider appeal. But what might go against it is a bit like people with um, a phobia of clowns is it might be too intense. They just they can't put themselves through it because they might not be able to sleep. They might have a panic attack. They might have like really bad nightmares, which is completely fair enough. I, I don't think a lot of people take uh, other people's phobias too seriously. Like sometimes it's a bit of a joke if, if it's not like a full-on phobia. Like I don't consider mine a full-on phobia, but I have spoken to people that um, have been in car accidents um, not because the spider itself or the huntsman caused the accident, so to speak, but they saw the huntsman in their car, if it was on the steering wheel or the roof or whatever, and they literally froze or they had a panic attack and they crashed their car. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, yeah, I still do have a cold. Turns out it's COVID. Um, so please bear with me. I do sound probably a bit better than I do on did on Late Night with the Devil a couple of days ago. So, yeah, anyway, I'll stop blabbering on as I always do uh, and yeah I'll get into the spoiler territory so if you don't want any more spoilers pause this go watch the movie come back and we'll, you can listen to my thoughts and tell me how wrong or right I am in the comments or leave a review <laughs> completely up to you so anyway I've stopped uh, stopped talking for just over 10 minutes now and we can get into the full depth now Unfortunately, because there is no Wikipedia page for Infested and it was hard to get a full, well-written synopsis on what happened in the movie, I don't have that uh, for this episode, unfortunately. It was a shame because I always try to do that as best I can. I think I've only maybe missed out not once before. But uh, anyway, I'll try and uh, garner the full uh, happenings of the movie with my points and reviews. And it is really hard to take notes on my phone, uh, which is much quicker than handwritten like I started doing, but I've been doing my phone the last probably six weeks and that's a lot quicker, but I still have to look up and down from my phone, especially with a subtitled movie. That's probably the only uh, negative to reviewing as subtitled film. But anyway, <clears throat> like I said from the top, I really, really enjoyed this movie. It was a really great fun watch. I was on the edge of my seat for 70, 80% of it. Uh, I thought the characters were really good. Like, I cared enough about them. Uh, the setting was really cool. I like this sub I mean, it's not a new sub by any means, but it's a sub that's getting more movies added to it the last, like, four or five years. And it's a sub of... Um, we all know, like, horror movies in confined spaces have been a big thing for a long time due to budgetary things. And it just people, like, tended to like that. And I'm included in that. But we've even got like a sub sub genre of that sub genre of um, there's a lot of s- subs and genres I just said uh, of people in high rises or apartment buildings. And like I said, that's not a new setting, that's not a new thing. But we have noticed that we're getting more horror movies and just more movies in general set in that setting. And obviously, Evil Dead Rise, probably exactly a year ago, was probably the biggest one in that. And I do really like. I mean, we got Slasher season three was in the same setting. Uh, obviously, real life tops up, but it wasn't fully confined to it. But a lot of the big things, like in you know, the Dharma miniseries on Netflix was his apartment, which kind of, yeah, apartments are not that very creepy places there, um, especially when they're like, a movie like this, are kind of the lower economic type people. But this movie, I, I have to say, this movie did a really good job of uh, not, I'm trying to think of the word, like not, 
treating people that live in this type of environment uh, badly at all. I I think the characters we got and their uh, faithfulness in each other and their love of each other and the community spirit generally in this apartment building was captured really well because, I mean, a lot of the time that's just how it is. Just because there's people a lot of economic and they don't have the best living circumstances doesn't mean they're bad people. And this movie really captures that. So big tip of the hat to them for doing that because a lot of movies don't do that at all. And yeah, that just goes down to like the writing, the acting and the directing. And yeah, no, big kudos to them. Uh, the, yeah, the spider effects were really, really good. I think more than 90% of it was uh, CGI, like computer generated spiders. Uh, but I think for a few scenes, there might've been uh some practical effects if there were like puppets or or just maybe some robotic legs or whatever because I feel as though you could definitely tell the difference and especially in some scenes where like in the hallway scene to the garage where there was like hundreds and hundreds of spiders not all of them were moving I noticed so I think maybe a lot of them would they did maybe half of just like these plastic spiders and then they just CG'd the rest in or maybe they just cleaned up some um cleaned up some spiders with CGI afterwards to make them look like they were moving or whatnot. I'm not sure, but for a movie that clearly didn't have a massive budget, again, it's hard to really uh, get a gauge on what the budget was, but uh, I think they did well with every cent they had, in all honesty. So um, I love how, like, at the start, uh, and by the way, if people get a bit worried, because I did at the start, uh, it's in... A Middle Eastern desert somewhere. I don't think it actually says where. And we have these Arabic gentlemen uh, searching for spiders. Uh, that's not subtitled at all, but don't worry. I think it's meant to be like that because the rest of the movie is subtitled. So don't worry that it's a, a shutter problem or you're not going to be able to read what's happening. For whatever reason, obviously it wasn't important, the dialogue. It's not subtitled, so don't worry. I just thought I'd make that a bit clear because I was a tad worried for a couple of minutes. But yeah, so... Uh, I thought it was funny the scene where they're gassing the spider out and they're trying to get these spiders. They've obviously realised like a new uh, species of spider in the desert, like in the middle of bumfuck nowhere. And one leaps out as they're gassing the hole, one leaps out onto the dude and the rest of the um, people are garring all the spiders and he's getting attacked and they don't really care. They're all focusing on just getting the spiders and... One dude walks over and pretty much kills the dude because he's been bitten because they know that once he's bitten, he's stuffed. So that that scene shows you like, okay, well, we know they're giving us explanation on some like further things that are going to happen with the spiders. Like they know that, okay, well, these, these spiders so dangerous that uh, they have to kill the dude that got bitten by it. Then He's not really going to kill him because he doesn't want to cut him to the hospital. So he's killing him because he knows that he's, he's fucked. There's no saving him. So that was a good... Quick little scene, it gave us, you know, where these spiders are coming from, that they're going to be obviously shipped over to France and that they're dangerous and these people know that they're dangerous, but it's focusing on the real life problem of black market, you know, um, exotic animals and the exotic animal trade and whatnot, that that's still like, it's a billion dollar industry and it's still a problem that's happening. So people are willing to ship these dangerous spiders over for money and that's a real life thing and i do like when they use that in these types of movies when it comes to snake movies and spider movies and whatever like these smaller killer animal movies is that i mean it's a real life problem it's 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 a realistic plot device that you can use that okay well the reason why the main character ends up with it is because it was uh illegally shipped over to a country for money as part of the black market exotic animal trade. So that's what you need to do. Hey, you might say that it's lazy, that it's cliche, but it, like I said, it's a, still a real life problem. And like I said, it's a billion dollar injury. It's still happening. So why not use it as a plot device and it makes sense. So I don't I don't see a problem with that. I thought that was good enough. Uh, I really liked the uh, soundtrack. It was a like a rap R&B type thing and that fit the characters because a lot of the main characters especially like younger generation uh if i was to guess they'd be like mid uh, early to mid 20s maybe late 20s around that mark and um yeah i thought it fit all their personalities well and the setting of the movie uh the apartment building in france so yeah no i thought it was really cool 
obviously, I don't speak a lick of French, so I had no idea what the actual lyrics were, but it sounded cool. <laughs> uh, the unique building design was really cool. Like It was like a big circle. And apparently, that's, that's actually a real building. Uh, I, I don't know if it's a real apartment building, but I know it's a real building in France. So that was really cool. They were able to film some exterior shots of that, some good... Um, yeah, some good shots there. Uh, I like the the lead character is endearing, especially Caleb. Uh, we see him for the first time. He goes into this corner shop and he goes out the back to buy some obviously illegal jewelry. And he uh, sees the spider there, asks the dude about it, and the dude lumbers the necklace as a present to his neighbor. And they're spotted together. And at first, I'm like, oh, you know, that random like cliche of the main character just seeing, you know, like this exotic animal, be like, oh, you know, I'm just going to buy this, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, really? Like, that's kind of like a cheap, boring way. But then you get to know about the character. You go back to his room. He's got all these exotic animals and he's pissed off. His sister keeps turning off the electricity in his room to save power, to save the electricity bill because they're obviously struggling to afford anything that he cracks it because his animals might die. He's, you know, he's got frogs. He's got, like, these centipede things. He's got, uh, I think, uh, well, like, not a cricket, uh, grasshoppers and stuff. So that made sense. Okay, then you get to know about him and about Geordie as well, that they both grew up wanting to have their own, like, reptile zoo. And so that made sense. I thought, okay, well, at least they've given him a bit of a backstory behind why he wanted something like a spider. Because it's been done in the past where people have just seen like an exotic animal, and thought, oh, that's cool, I want that. Just as a plot device to get this animal or reptile or whatever in this environment to cause havoc. But this, no, this made sense, and I I really did like that. And the scene where he puts the spider in the shoebox and ends up um, biting through, and then it ends up making like a cocoon, and because it wanted to eat, uh, he had like one of those um, pictures of like dissected, uh, like taxidermied insects, like butterflies and um, those types of things in like a picture frame. He's obviously into that weird shit. And that was really creepy when he finds the web over it. And then he, I thought this, the scene with Tien was quite, quite funny because Caleb obviously has his shoe business. It was illegal or not, I'm not sure. I don't think that it is because he keeps... Telling his other friend, um, I'm going to botch his name. I don't know if it's a Mathis or Matthias. So it's good. I'm just going to call him Mathis, but that's probably fucking wrong. But anyway, it's hard. Because um, Mathis kept stealing bikes, bikes from the neighborhood and going to sell them. And Caleb's like, no, I want to be legitimate. Blah, blah, blah. So he obviously has a history of doing dodgy things like selling drugs because the neighbor, uh, the bold neighbor that's an arsehole, brings that up. So that was a good thing that Caleb's trying to turn his life around. We learn that his mum died. Him and his sister don't have a great relationship. But I like that there was a differential of their coping mechanisms between him and his sister. It was very realistic. You see it happen a lot. I thought it was really good where the sister's very, she wants to move on. She's kind of forgetting about it. But in doing so, she's sheltering herself from everyone and kind of blocking everyone out. And he keeps calling her selfish because he says the neighbors are all there for us. They looked after us, our family when our mum died. And you're bottling all your emotions up and you're boxing everyone out. But Caleb, on the other end, is he won't let go of it. He's still very emotional about it. He He's struggling to move on. He hates his sister because she wants to sell the apartment building, but he will obviously wants to cling on to it because he's got memories with their mum there. So, yeah, great character building stuff between those two. It makes you care for them. And then we get the the uh, stuff with Geordie that they were childhood friends. They were best friends and they were obviously estranged because... You know, they insult each other and they're not big fans of each other. But it turns out that when they want to do their reptile business, uh, Caleb's lizard bit Geordie on the leg and that kind of ruined their hopes of anything because Geordie then held him responsible. But then it turns out Geordie was telling people that it was a scooter accident so Caleb wouldn't get the blame. So, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, there was Geordie's girlfriend as well, Lila. She was involved with it. And then you have Mathis, who was kind of the goofy, comedic side guy but it was he was a great character method so he probably turned out to be my my favorite character and i'll touch on that very shortly um yeah i've already stated like the um 
it wasn't just a random bar for Cal. He obviously loves these type of animals, so I thought that was just, yeah, a nice touch. It was enough to give the story um, a bit of legs. No pun intended. Uh, I love when Caleb goes back to his room and realizes that he's, he's turned off the power once again, turns it back on, realizes that the spider's broken its way out of the box. And I like the realistic side of it. Like, he didn't notice the little hole in the corner of the box that the spider had bitten through. He opens the lid really slowly to make sure it doesn't jump out at him and he can't find it. So he's slowly, methodically pulling all the paper and stuff that he put in there, thinking that it just got cold. So he's trying to keep itself warm. And he pulls all that, he's looking for it. And then the realization when he finds the hole is pure panic. And the first thing he does is look over his shoulder and then he looks above him. That is the most realistic reaction <laughs> to not knowing where a spider is ever because that's what I do. That's what we all do, especially if you have the slightest hint of arachnophobia is you look over your shoulder that's not on your back or something and you look above you that it's not on a roof above you. It's just one of those general fears you have surrounding spiders. And I thought it was just really realistic and really good because I definitely uh, I definitely felt that for sure. Uh, the bald guy being really rude when um, Tien and Caleb were doing their transaction with the shoes because Tien well, only wanted Tien shoes because everyone calls him Tien, but Caleb said no one calls him Tien. I thought that was quite funny. Um, yeah, the the bold neighbor, I can't remember his name, but he accuses of a drug deal going down because he obviously doesn't like them and being a real douchebag. That's telegraphed that he's going to have a gruesome death later on, but I didn't feel justified that he was kind of killed off screen. It was a bit disappointing because he's a real douchebag of a character, but <coughs> excuse me, he, he died nonetheless, so that's the main thing. Uh, yeah, I like the realism of the spiders not being... Like, there's a few really large ones, like, I won't lie, but generally, this wasn't like an eight-legged freak situation where they're, like, fucking 15, 20 foot tall and massive and super unrealistic. That's what I'm talking about of the realism of it, where there are spiders that when they reproduce with each other and they make these hybrids and stuff, they do get to really, really big sizes. Not probably to the extent of the movie, but it is a movie, so you have to keep that in mind, but they do get to really, really big sizes. And I liked the realistic look of them. They did kind of actually look like Huntsman's here in Australia, except for the markings and the colouring were a bit different than what we have. But, <coughs> excuse me, that really, like, hit home for me. I'm looking at these spiders. I'm like, fuck, they look like Huntsman's here in Australia, man. Like, I'm, I'm not a massive fan of these. It's kind of making me feel uncomfortable with it. It really worked. Uh, the clicking noise, like, the clicking noise that their fangs are making throughout the movie is something that, you know, a lot of movies will play like the same uh, score, the same music throughout the movie. This movie, pretty much, once the whole apartment building apartment building is infested, then they literally the clicking noise is something you hear constantly, and it just it it's a noise that really keeps you and the characters on edge and makes you feel as though you're in that building. And it's yeah, it's horrifying stuff. Yeah, I've already spoken about Math. It's like he he was a great character. Like he started off with the first scene, literally the first scene we see him when Caleb's accessing his lockbox, like his little shed thing with all of his shoes in it. Mathis walks in with his stolen bikes and Caleb then realizes there's heaps of stolen bikes in his lockup and he tells Mathis to clean his shit up and clean his act up in general. And yeah, Mathis just becomes a bit more of like a better character throughout. Like he kind of gets fleshed out a bit more that uh, you know, he talks about he was a boxer, but he's into MMA now. Uh, and he's kind of, yeah, like he, he, he tries to help out when there's arguments and stuff. And they always tell him to butt out because he's kind of like the fifth wheel in this situation. Because they have the two couples of Lila and Geordie. And then you have obviously the brother and sister relationship. And then you have him. <laughs> but he was really cool. Like he turned to be a nice heroic character. but And it wasn't like heroic where like a real goofy, cowardly, cowardly character then all of a sudden becomes like a superhero in a movie like it wasn't that it was really justified that he i mean he's obviously got bravery because he fights in the boxing ring and in the M mma cage so that was enough to tell you that okay well <clears throat> sorry okay well he's got no fear that he's brave to a degree he he's scared of the spies like everyone else so that, he has normal reactions but he's the one that really takes control to try and get the characters out of this situation I did really, really love the uh, the scenes with all like all this, the spider webs and stuff. I thought the 
hallway to the garage scene was probably my favorite scene. That was really, really good and really, really done well. Where there's just hundreds of these spiders, there's spider webs all on the walls, all on the roof, and some of them covered in the floor, making like little kind of like hurdles almost. And they realize that the light, obviously, is one of those garage lights to save power, obviously, because you had most of the time when you're heading to a garage, you're going to be gone for a few hours. They don't want to leave the light on all the time. So it's got like a, I think they said a minute timer. <coughs> Excuse me. And they all run to throw it whilst uh, their sister stays back and holds it. And then she has to run back. And you're like, is she going to make it back in time? You know, what's going to happen? The light goes out while she gets pretty much stuck in a web on her face and the spider right near her face. And I'm still not quite sure entirely like what the the scope of this bit was where she had the lighter up to see what was happening. There's a big spider right near her face. And instead of burning it, she just ducked her head and just ran away from it. I'm not sure why she didn't burn it because Caleb was saying burn it, but I don't know. But <clears throat> what the weird thing... That is isn't really commonly uh, paired with spiders is like the not the fear of light, but light stops them. <laughs> like they're like as long as it's dark, the spiders will chase after the characters and whatever. But as soon as there's light on them, they'll pause. So wasn't really explained. It's a bit weird. I know that these are hybrid spiders and blah blah blah, blah but that's not really a thing that's genuinely with spiders. But, yeah, it didn't rule my experience. I thought it was a bit odd. Um, I'll probably talk it overly positive, but I did really enjoy this movie. But there are some negative. But the the scene, well, this is a positive that lent into a negative, was Tien is the first one to be bitten by a spider because it turns out when Cub couldn't find the spider, but he grabbed Tien's shoes, was the spider was in Tien's shoes. And he ends up getting bitten because he's grabbed his shoe out and puts it on, and that's a good thing where a lot of arachnophobes, we always check our shoes before we put them on, and he doesn't, he just puts his foot in it, and he gets beaten, and it really, like this scene with Ten really leans into the body horror, because he's, it's a good scene of like the blurry cam showing him starting to be delirious, he doesn't know where he is, he's confused, he's sweating profusely, he's got all these bites and stuff over him. He's full, like, having, like, he's, like, he's possessed. Like, it's like he's having, he's being exercised because his body's moving moving in, like, a not normal way. And it really leads the body, into the body. His eyes are going red and he ends up dying. And then his poor dog ends up eating the spider and then the dog has a gruesome death. But I don't like animals dying in movies. Well, not, like, you know, good animals like dogs and ones that aren't bad spiders in a movie. So I won't talk about the dog's death too much, but... <coughs> That happens a bit later on anyway, but what the negative from this is that I then thought, oh, cool, that's like a really different way to interpret a spider movie is that this might be a more body horror type movie where when these people get bitten, it's going to be like, yeah, like a full body horror, like their body's going to like fall apart, flesh is going to come off, they're going to vomit out blood or their eyes are going to fill up with blood and shit. Tian scene was like the only one that was like that. The rest were just your typical spider, like people getting attacked by him and um, Geordie's death in like the garage hallway, he just got cocooned and then just got slowly bitten. We didn't really see any of the effects from that. The bold guy's death was off scene, off screen, sorry. One one death that did really hit me hard was the old dude that we met at the party towards the start that was telling the boys off for smoking, was talking to Mathis about his boxing and MMA and Blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> and he, when they're trying to get everyone to escape and he, they're checking on Claudia, the neighbor, that uh, turns out to be infested. Literally, her body's infested with spiders. This old dude approaches him with a glass and they said, look, he's been bitten. Like, don't go near him. And Matthew's like, no, no, no. Like, we've got to help him. And then Caleb convinces him to tell him to go back to his room. So he does. And with music playing and stuff, and you, they go into the old dude's apartment and you see all these glasses on the floor that are all covering the spiders. He'd obviously himself captured them. And then he's crashed over in the corner and ends up dying. And I thought it was a very sad scene. I thought that's so sad that Caleb and 
Mathis were being rude to this guy that they thought they were trying to help and also protect themselves. But he ends up dying by himself in the corner after, you know, protecting himself from so many spiders. I thought that was really sad. <laughs> One scene, I don't think I can remember his name. Uh, Musa, I think it was. Musa, the young fellow that was always getting told off for being like a douchebag with fireworks and uh, not showing respect in front of the elderly people and stuff. <laughs> He's like rapping and like trying to act cool in, in front of his mirror. And it's the typical like spider behind him in the mirror thing. And he sees it, turns around, can't can't find it. He's looking for it, he's looking for it. And they're trying to get his attention, but they can hear music that they can't get his attention. And there's the big massive spider's on his wall. And he's like sizing it up. And <laughs> he just put his foot through the wall to kill it. I thought it was just really funny because we all have that thing where like I've always said if I've come across a spider and it scared me so much I'd punch a hole through a wall which I physically probably couldn't but Musa to actually put his whole leg through the wall was quite funny and then the reveal when he puts his head through the wall and the cavity is just filled with webs and he hears the clicking noise and he ends up getting bitten and dying so that turned from a, a, a funny scene to a, a sad scene but I mean, we always knew that the the core five were going to be our main characters. I was really surprised that Geordie died. Was the first one to die of the core five. I wasn't surprised that Mathis died. I thought that he was going to be the like, sacrificial lamb, ended up uh, sacrificing himself. But in a weird way, I'll say that he let the spiders out so they would distract the cops and kill himself in doing so. So the other three could escape but get out. But he was also putting them in danger with the spiders. So... I don't know if that entirely makes sense because they knew that most people in the pump building were going to be dead. So, yeah, that kind of scene was a bit shit. Although the ending overall was a bit mediocre, unfortunately. I thought the rest of the movie was really good. So when you have the execution of the... Oh, I won't say the climax because the climax of was them pretty much going up the stairs trying to get to the roof and they get to the near top of the roof and they ended up getting in the fault with the cops, which was a, a fun scene on, on the edge of your seat stuff. That was the climax, and it kind of went a little bit downhill from there. And we obviously have the three of them survive. We have Lila, uh, the sister, which I can't remember her name, and Caleb all survive. In a weird scene, <clears throat> just before Caleb escapes through the garage door with the spider, the mass, like, probably the biggest spider that we'd seen close up so far in the movie, is in front of the car. And it's doing the thing that spiders do when they get on their hind legs. And they put their front legs up and they show their fangs off and they click at you. It means that they they feel as though they're threatened and they're going to attack if you don't piss off. So it's doing that to the car. And then Caleb tells them to turn the lights off and they do and it just scurries off when Caleb's sitting right next to it. But we've seen them go towards humans before. I thought that was really silly. That didn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, So except for the ending, I thought most of it was done well. I thought like the tone throughout was good. The pacing was really good. Like the movie had you on the edge of your seat with the music and the way it was filmed with a lot of close-ups and a lot of panic and yelling and screaming, swearing. That, yeah, it does really keep you on edge and like, you're like, oh, what the fuck's happening? Like, it does do a really good job of that. If you're wanting a movie that will keep you engaged, this is definitely a movie for that, in my opinion. I was engaged throughout, even though it was subtitled. subtitled. Um, yeah, the... I did like the scene of the main characters <clears throat> trying to save all their neighbours and stuff. Like, Caleb shows that he's a, a great neighbour and he still cares. He's a bit flawed as a person and as a, bit, and, and as a character, but he shows that he cares about his neighbours because they were there for him and he has love. And Then his sister pretty much apologises at the end that she wasn't there for him and she does love the place. She doesn't want to sell it, but they need to figure something next they can't afford it. So that's the usual, you know... Uh, fixing of the of the sibling relationship towards the end, which was telegraphed. But I mean, you get those a lot in movies because a lot of people want that type of stuff. Uh, the scene with Lila screaming just after Geordie's been killed and they get to the room and it's just pure darkness and all you hear is Lila screaming and the others trying to... Well, the sister trying to calm her down, Khaled's panicking in the corner and Mathis is just, just quiet. Just pure darkness, just you don't see anything, you just hear Lila screaming and crying and stuff. It was really like confronting it, like it was a really, really good scene. And this is one of those horror movies where it's so different 
to a slasher movie where this is one of those horror movies, like I said, it, it it's a serious it takes itself as serious as possible. So it wants you to care about these characters. It's different than an eighties slasher where you're wanting most of the characters, except maybe one or two, to get killed. Like you're looking forward to the killer or antagonist to kill these characters just because you're looking for the kills, right? You're watching a slasher movie for the kills. For Infested, you're watching this because you want these characters to to survive. You want to know how they're getting themselves out of this fucking dire situation. And that was done really well. I cared about the characters. I was I was upset when Geordie died, especially he was the first one to die. I was disappointed when Mathis died, especially in the lackluster way that he died. I wasn't didn't think it was justified for his character and how good he was, the actor. But, you know, you're happy that three out of the five main characters survive. You're sad that all the other neighbors, especially Claudia and the old fella and Musa, all good characters in their own right, kind of die. And we were given enough of them to care for them and be upset when they died as well. All we need to do is just give us a little bit to hang on to and tell us why we should care for these side characters. Because they're pretty much telling you, okay, you're we're telling you what to care, like why to care for them. So when they die, you do care. And they do a really, really good job of that. So hands off to the uh, filmmakers for that. So yeah, I probably start to uh, land the plane here for the Infested Podcast just because my throat's starting to hurt and I'm struggling. My voice is cutting in and out with the boot up in my chest and my throat, so I apologize, but we've gotten past the 40-minute mark and... Um, <clears throat> right, thank you. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, as we always do on Goose Talks Film here, I like to review a movie uh, out of four categories. Each category is rated out of five, and those categories are directing, writing, acting, and cinematography. And then those scores will go to the overall score out of 20, and that will go towards, at the end of the year, I'll do a top 10 list of movies, like the highest rated movies I've covered, and then the bottom ones that I've covered in terms of ratings. So in terms of directing, I thought this was directed really, really well. Uh, There was some scenes, it was hard to see what was going on, which comes down to the directing and the cinematography, and like the lighting and all that. So a bunch of those two together. Overall, I thought the use of the setting was done like really, really well. That's what you want from these types of movies. Uh, and yeah, I thought, yeah, the directing was pretty good. I'd go 3.5 out of 5. The writing was good. Um, you know, although I enjoyed this movie, I mean, it wasn't entirely original. It hit a lot of the killer animal bits. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, yeah, look, it doesn't, always have to be 100% original to enjoy it. And this, yeah, wasn't that. It wasn't original. But it also wasn't beat for beat for beat of any horror horror movie you watch or any killer animal movie you watch. It was different enough. And the characters were well written. I thought, yeah, the dialogue was good. So I'll go a three out of five. I thought the ending just wasn't the ending that I think we all deserved. And the filmmakers themselves deserved either. So three out of five the writing. The acting, I thought, was, yeah, was really, really, really good. I cared enough for the characters. Uh, maybe got to a point where there's maybe a bit too yelling and stuff. But then I thought, well, what I'd do in that situation, I'd probably be very high-strung and be yelling and screaming and crying. So I thought the acting, yeah, 3.5 out of 5. Then the cinematography, like I said, um, in like the darkly lit hallways, the majority of the time you could see what was going on. There was a lot of like natural light from the torches and the fireworks and stuff they use and just in general, but some of the scenes was hard to see what was going on. There was uh, a lot of close-ups, some good like, long shots and establishing shots. And uh, yeah, the the spiders weren't fully re- revealed until towards the end. Like, I mean, hundreds of them and you could clearly see how they were, you know, made up and stuff. So 3.5 out of 5, I think, for the cinematography is good, which brings the overall score of Infested to... Th- 13.5 out of 20, which is quite a decent score. Not as much as Late Night with the Devil, but a very, very decent score to boot. So, yeah, I'll finish off with a little bit of trivia. There's not heaps of trivia, uh, but there's a little bit. So, as I always do here on Curse Talks Film, I do a little bit of trivia for the movie, which I literally just said that line 20 seconds ago. But, <laughs> but yeah, anyway, there's not heaps, but we'll get through a little bit of it. Writer director Sebastian Van Icek was looking for ideas around the discrimination faced by black and Arab-looking people in France 
and that led him to spiders, which are rarely welcome in homes. Whenever they're spotted, they're swatted. As everyone in the story, people and spiders, is treated like vermin by society. The title came to him naturally. I didn't 100% get that vibe to like the human characters, maybe from the cops a little bit, but we didn't get enough of that to to justify that, I don't think. But yeah, I get what he's saying. The visually striking buildings where the action is set have not been created for the movie. These are the Picasso Arenas in Noise Le Grand near Paris, designed by architect Manuel Nunes. Yankowski, probably I pronounced that wrong, in the 80s. So yeah, like I said, I knew they were real buildings, like good work scouting that. First future film director, Sebastian, who had a who had directed a few shorts before. He pitched the movie to producer Harry Tordman, who loved, and loved it and introduced him to Netflix. They loved it as well and thought the movie deserved a theatre release before ending up on Netflix, which is a big deal in France as the minimum legal delay in 2023 between a theatre release and availability on streaming platforms is 15 months for Netflix. 17 months for Disney Plus or Prime Video. Well, wow. Did that look? Well, what shit. We're lucky. The movie was shot in the Seine Saint Denis department next to Paris from January to early March 22. Right, so it took two years for this movie to hit our screens. Wow. I'm glad the movie's getting a lot of hype then. Ride director Sebastian really wanted to show the low-income housing community in France differently. According to him, whenever it's shown in movies, it's either a drama with drug dealing and all that, or a corny comedy. His perception is that in real life, it's mostly humming along just fine, with only a few issues here and there. Yeah, like I agree with it, which I already touched on that a little bit. I thought he did a good job of showing that. So, yeah, that'll bring the podcast to an end, guys. Um, thanks again, as always, listening, especially to these episodes where I'm a bit sick, and it's probably... Uh, this one wasn't so bad. I didn't have to pause and jump in and out of this as much like I did with the Late or the Devil episode because I'm sick, but I appreciate all the support. The last few episodes have been doing really well in terms of, of statistics, uh, impressions, and people clicking and listening and then listening to the whole thing. Like Baghead, for some reason, a couple of weeks ago, I must have dropped on it streaming somewhere because I covered that like early March. And about three weeks ago, start of April, it really popped off that episode. So a massive thanks to people for listening to that. Civil War uh, was one that really picked up a lot of listeners and stuff. So thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. And as always, guys, talks, talk, uh, Goose Talks Film all across social media, whatever platform you're listening to, make sure you subscribe, slash follow, leave a review, comment, whatever, whatever you want to do. Much appreciated. And as always, make sure you watch those movies, guys. Thank you. Goodbye.